my name is Katrina, and welcome to Craftivism with Adrienne and Elka at the CG Center for Craft. The Manitoba Craft Council was founded in 1978 as Manitoba's only not-for-profit arts organization dedicated exclusively to contemporary craft. We are gathered here today in what we now know as Manitoba, the ancestral heritage of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene, Anishinawak, Dakota Oyate, Dine Simone, and Nehetuok, Inuit peoples in the homeland of the Red River Métis. These lands include territories subject to treaties 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 10. Craft occupies a space that is the hand in the hand made of its center. It rejoices in sharing knowledge and solving problems. It stems from, creates, and nurtures community. It allows us to build bridges through shared action, but also, also fosters courage and clean connection. We acknowledge the deep harm caused by settlement, and we look forward to using craft in our efforts towards reconciliation and positive change. Please join me in welcoming Adriana today. Woo! Adriana is an artist living on Treaty 1 territory. A first-generation immigrant from Guatemala of complex identities, Alarcon is Latin, cisgender, queer, sober, and living with a disability. As a Mesta woman, she recognizes Spanish and Maya Kayachi ancestry through no direct claim to indigenous community. These identities guide her work to explore contradictions and connections. Alarcon incorporates cultural craft traditions and ancestral knowledge with contemporary narratives using fiber-based crafts such as knitting, crochet, embroidery, eating, and weaving. She has a bachelor degree from New York University in Cultural Studies. Alakon combines her art practice with art administration in Toronto and Winnipeg, working at artist-run centers such as A Space, Craft Pack Ontario, Craft Action Toronto, Steps, and Mawa. Her recent work, Care Capsule Capsules, was shown at Ace Art April 2022. <laughs> works for me today. So thank you, Katrina, and thanks to the Medical Craft Council for this opportunity. Uh, I know she uh, did a land acknowledgement. I just want to begin by acknowledging the privilege of being an immigrant to this land that we've come together on Treaty One territory, traditional territory and the ancestral home of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene, and the national homeland of the Red River. I'm also grateful for our water, which is sourced from Show Lake 40 First Nation. And somebody please remind me to drink water because <laughs> I am not forget and I'll just start coughing. <laughs> Thank you all for being here today. I know it's raining and traffic and parking are painful, but I really appreciate you being here with me today. I would like all of you to have questions and hold them to towards the end of the talk. Um, so I wanted to start with an anecdote, and it's the, the piece that you're seeing um, is was a temporal piece that I installed in Toronto. It was in 2014, 2013, and at, at that point I wanted to do something really meaningful to me. Um, so before I get into into that, I wanted to say that. Craft has taken me through like a journey and I've had a lot of different experiences with communities in craft. And one of the anecdotes that I wanted to start with is that in 2014 we were getting ready for the craft action to yield banners, um, ready for the dike march, but there was so much to do. So we had an event at the Gladstone Hotel in the lead up to the World Pride Parade. So 2014 in Toronto, it was World Pride. Usually Toronto Pride is about 2 million people attendees, and that year it was more like four. Um, so four million people just kind of show up on your backyard when you live down in Toronto. So author Catherine Hernandez was hosting the event, and she saw me intensely crocheting uh, in the corner instead of like, drinking with everyone. And she says, what are you doing? And I responded with crocheting, of course. And she says, what are you crocheting? And I say, um, an R. 
and suddenly she goes, the rest of us are making our sounds with sharpies like fools. <laughs> Um, so, for the sake of position, positionality, I guess I'm a craftivist, and the term craftivist has been around since the late 90s. There's been a lot of um, iterations of it, and I'll just show you some examples of it. And there has been a lot of criticism, so much criticism, of uh, what, craft, what craftivism means and what its place is within the art world. So I don't think that craftivism is a dirty word, but I do think that it has been co-opted like everything else by capitalism. In March of this year, I was invited to speak to the folks at the Jaroslavski Institute in Montreal and address this question. Was Joyce Wieland a craftivist? Joyce Wieland, of course, was a visual artist working in the 70s. And in my brief study of Wieland, and we actually went into the vault at the Museum of Modern Art in Montreal to look at some of her pieces, and we spent two days studying the work of, of Joyce Wieland, and I decided that yes, she was. I will tell you why in uh, just a little bit. So it made me look back at many other contemporary artists and think about including BIPOC folks under the, umbre the activism umbrella. There's the umbrella. Show you the Each down, right? So, craftivism is a slow, creative, and mindful form of action using arts and crafts as tools for collective empowerment and expression. And that is a quote I pulled from someone called Paul Fitzpatrick. When we look back and include someone like Joyce Wheeland among activists, the door is open to many other people who have engaged in the process of activism for far longer than just in the last 20 or 40 years. In fact, we can extend the reach of activism back to before the contact of Europeans with indigenous people in this land. For my look at craftivism and contemporary artists' place in it, I think about the process of craftivism, and I will stick to textile arts such as knitting, crochet, beading, embroidery, and some similar activities that were deemed home crafts, which many artists leaned, but learned at home at a young age, but later discarded as a means of formal art making, because anything that was feminine and anything that was seen as a, as a sort of a time-passing activity was deemed not hard enough. But I like the definition that I quoted earlier because it includes the process of activism. I believe that the mindful, laborious, handmade aspect is only the beginning of the process. Collective empowerment is another important aspect of activism. Craftivism is urgent, it's passionate, it's earnest, it's I have the patience to stab something a thousand times with a point, small pointy object, so I will make my point. So I'm showing you an image of my rainbow yarn bomb of 2013, and I'll tell you another anecdote. This is the story of this piece, and it's deeply personal, and at the time it seemed vital and urgent. I installed it days before heading to a rehab facility in Toronto. My big concern was that I would miss all of pride, which was a tragedy, but also it was a blessing for someone pledging sobriety. My crafty solution was to leave a gift of yarn and color on the 519 grounds so that I could be there in a way. 519 is a community center uh, that specifically serves the LGBTQ uh, to us, asterisk, population, and the, the outside grounds, the green uh, area of it, usually turns into a giant party. So that's where I wanted to be, but because I wasn't going to be able to attend, I, I left my mark uh, in advance. I created the piece alone in mindful, quiet meditation. This was the precursor to the craft action TO interventions. 
and I'll show some more images of those later. But I want to include some other examples of practicalisms and thoughts on why I would include Joyce Whelan and many other artists from before the turn was coined. And I want to include many BIPOC folks amongst practicalists. So in 2014, a year later, I was hired by Pride Toronto to create a one banner to lead the Dyke March at the World Pride events. The process would be to meet for eight weeks with community members and collectively create one banner. We also put out a call for contributions so folks from outside Toronto could mail in any knitted, crochet, embroidered, or other textiles to be included in the banner. We used a collaborative patchwork aesthetic with each letter being made by a different participant in varying techniques, including even applique and some folk work. I have some friends here today that were there. It's the Rosada. This was the group uh, of the Pact Action folks, and we are standing outside of the York Public Library, where we used to meet on Saturday afternoons. We had snacks, conversation, lots of shared interests, and lots of fun. I embroidered the map of 
of, the, of Turtle Island, on the upper right hand corner, I stitched the words No More Silence. We used an online source, an online source that tracked the cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women, and we used one strawberry to represent five individual women. You can see the concentration in Winnipeg, Regina, and Vancouver. We carried the banner in the guide march. We staged the diamond. And I remember that in previous years, the dive march was always covered by the media as an afterthought. But this time, the call for an inquiry received a fair amount of news coverage. And we have to remember this was quite a while ago, and, and it was before the inquiry. <clears throat> the term activism became well known in the early 2000s. Both Betsy Greer and the Craftivism Collective are credited with pointing the term, though the two were working independently of each other. There have been many contributions to the movement by groups and individuals around the world, and many art forms that long predate them can be qualified as craftivism. If we view them from the lens of the process of craftivism, we can rewind or fast forward to find lots of examples of craftivism. In the last two years, I received over 200 Google alerts for craftivism. There are examples of high art, grassroots level organizing, which sometimes leads to gallery exhibitions. There's criticism in survey books that focus on the quality of the work produced, the significance of the causes champion. There's criticism of the fact that a lot of the causes that are championed by, by craftivists are deemed progressive and so only within a certain review are paid attention, and so there isn't too much more visibility. Sometimes the critics have focused on the measured impact that craftivism has on any given cause. They argue that since the problems are ongoing, that craftivism is somehow ineffective. So how effective is it to stitch a Me Too embroidery? How much does that curb the actual problem behind it. In fact, tackling the issues of the day is a task that can leave activists drained. We can despair, or we can come together and make our cause visible. The Liberty Crochet Mural is a large-scale community yarn mural measuring 17 feet by 11 feet. It consists of 42 by 2 feet squares patchwork together. Each piece was assigned to a crocheter or community member. The design is in response to the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Each participant demonstrated in fiber their descent of SCOTUS overturning their rights to bodily autonomy, reproductive freedom, and their lives. They say that with each loop and every stitch, we amplify millions of unheard and unrepresented voices and show how powerful women's work is. Since June 2022, 25 different Liberty Crochet murals have been created across the United States. Our, the murals have been displayed at concerts, rallies, marches, health centers, art shows, a synagogue, and on buildings and parks and government buildings. You can learn more about this project at libertycrochetmural.com. On the anniversary of the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in custody of Iranian morality police, a banner was displayed at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. Artist Hujar Muradi created the banner with the words Woman, Life, Freedom, which is the English translation of the Kurdish phrase Jin Jian Asadi, the rallying cry for the feminist revolution that followed the death of Amini. Amini was arrested for improper attire because she did not wear a hijab. The banner is currently on display at the CMHR until May 10, until March 10th, 2024.
As I mentioned, I studied some of Joyce Whelan's work and concluded that we can call some of her work activism. Her work questioned nationalism and challenged the tropes of Canadiana. It seems like she's sympathetic to uh, then Prime Minister Trudeau, but I think there was something campy and sly about her pieces that makes me think that she was trying to get people not to take his posture seriously. From what I've read, she used the process of creating community, of caring for the well-being of her co-creators, giving them proper credit and proper payment for their work. So those are, those are things that I value in terms of artistic collective um, creation, and I saw that that was something that she did, she also included. Like I said, I'm, I'm going to be rewinding and going back forwards uh, many times. So now I'm going back to um, the 150, the Canada 150 events. So while, while Joyce Whelan was, was working in response to the uh, one, Canada's 100, this is Helene Wasters inter interrogating nationalism in her work. Unbecoming nationalism critiques the institutions that perform the established nationalism. Boster zeroed in on the Canada 150 events and questioned the government's inaction on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. Her work, stitch by stitch, is pictured here, is left unfinished as a reminder that reconciliation is an ongoing process that requires collective and sustained labor. I think that many artists can be curated under a banner of, pure, of practicalism as long as the work has been made with the process in mind. And that would be a powerful exploration of the themes that have been addressed by a process of practicalism. Topics such as anti-capitalism, environmentalism, and indigenous sovereignty and solidarity. I definitely include Barb Hunt's anti-personnel works. This is a collection of replicas of the copious varieties of landmines. Hunt makes the object seem warm and inviting, and the viewer is seduced into confronting their comfort in living in a world where these objects are so abundant and commonplace. She goes into great detail in constructing each piece which speaks to how serious she is about the issue. And while she accepts how impossible it is for anti-war act activists to physically locate and disarm the weapons, Hunt calls on nations at war to change their practices. Okay. In my opinion, the big blue farmer is a great example of the process of activism. And this is in Tasmania, Australia. A woman looked at the blue baling twine and started knitting with it rather than letting it go to the waste. She got other folks knitting and created the big blue farmer to represent and combat issues of depression, anxiety, and isolation.
sustainability with the topic of mental health beautifully. And it led people to get together and knit with the blue twine. And while they knit, they could talk to one another. Community building, it seems, is half the battle. There are many criticisms on craftivism that focus on artists' inability to roll back the clock. Be it climate change, or gender-based violence, or war, critics of craftivism tend to focus on our inability to fix the problem. They may steer the conversation to examples of craft washing, where many forms of for-profit and so-called handcrafted enterprises get lumped in craftivism. But I go back to the big blue farmer. This is a phenomenal example of craftivism, the process. There's a need, a heartfelt pledge, and the bringing together of otherwise isolated individuals who might feel helpless to find a solution. Okay, now I'm showing you a handmade hand signing I love you in American Sign Language. This was joyfully posted by Kay Ferguson to the mildly offensive fiber artist group. Fun. Craftivism, the process, utilizes large and clear visual imagery to communicate concisely. It's over and it's to the point. The message is intended to be consumed quickly and rather than with shouting, we use gestures and silence. Craftivism uses the quiet opposition as one of its hot hallmarks. It can be used to visually silence homophobic placards and to create quiet spaces amidst noisy demonstrations. This piece is Craft Action TO's family, family tree umbrella which is strategically blocking some hateful messages that were not welcome at the parade. This is a 2019 photo by Tanya Tiziana. The umbrella is made up of a large crocheted uh, tablecloth, which I dyed uh, green, a rainbow sash, which was mailed in from Kitchener, and multiple colored flowers that were made by the Craft Action Teal folks back in 2014. And here's the umbrella fighting homophobia in 2014. This is an installation view of Walking with Our Sisters, the groundbreaking project by the, the Walking with Our Sisters Collective led by Christy Belfort and others. Over 2,000 pairs of maps were submitted to the Walking with Our Sisters Collective, each representing a woman, girl, or two-spirit person whose whereabouts are unknown. The growing collection traveled to 27 locations in a span of seven years, culminating in Betoche, Saskatchewan. Simone Sanders hooked map It Matters on the left, and on the right is the work of Dominic King. It is a representation of a, seat, of a 25 cent coin that reads Justice 2022. In, so, in self, we trust. Craftivism use, often includes covert messages that signal to other members of the community. King posted this piece with the hashtag, if you know, you know. examples of craftivism that I saw last year as Russia invaded Ukraine. Stand with Ukraine heart pins by Jessica Kuzelis and the intricate Pax Boviska lace shawl by Kayleen Wilson. There's great contrast here. While the hearts are crafted quickly and the stitching is noticeab noticeably urgent, the shawl is intricate but a great degree of care is visible in both pieces. This is a spark protest at the COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, <coughs> last year. For decades now, when the nations meet to work on the climate crisis, they are undoubtedly met with loud, intense protests. Knit-ins 
for other radical craft-based interventions often take place because they are an effective way to make a statement that politicians will at least see if they can't be forced to listen. Environmental causes make up a large portion of the examples of activism that I found. In this example, various groups from across the UK worked together to make a mile and a half long scarf to be displayed at, the, at Glasgow during the climate summit. The scarf represents the 1.5 degree Celsius maximum global tar temperature target that was signed by up to 197 contract countries in the Paris Agreement, which we are not going to meet. Sections of the scarf have also been used to campaign locally and were displayed at the Sterling Climate Festival and at protests outside of chemical plants. This piece makes me think about the re rebellious doilies and subversive stitches in which Christy Robertson writes about various critics that view practice actions as non-confrontational and completely ineffective. I wonder if these kinds of criticisms are only directed at knitters, who are mostly women and gender minorities, and not at the politicians and their giant environmental footprint as they go for decades, year after year, to global summits and conferences and meetings where they probably get nothing done. They, too, also fail at rolling back the clock. I was thinking a lot about Don Janet Morton's Cozy, and this piece, I don't recall what year it was. It was in 2008. It came to mind because it was an implicit critique of the red high rates of homelessness in a neighborhood known as Trinity Square Park in Toronto. The reading of this piece was quite different when the installation was made in Ward's Island. So place has a big part in how craftivism is read. my care capsules. They are interactive pieces which are knitted and incorporate beading. They also contain sweet grass inside. They are intended to be held, hugged, and squeezed. They were part of a group show titled La Cura, or The Cure, organized by Mujeratista Collective, now known as Miradorex. I have been knitting and otherwise stitching since I was four years old. And this handcraft practice has always been a centering mindful activity that I gravitate towards as a form of medicine. Even though I have a disability, I insist on crafting as I believe it slows the advance of my condition. The care capsules were my response to the epidemic of despair and outrage to the many causes that were made more visible in 2020 in the midst of the global pandemic. This is another response to the pandemic. This mask or garden was dedicated to the people who took up gardening as a way of, to care for themselves and their community. While I'm very not much not a green thumb, I took many walks during the lockdowns and I noticed so many new gardens in my neighborhood. I felt that the care that people t put into them could reach across the isolation. Sometimes practicalism is a solitary activity, but there is hope that the work will bridge gaps and in our connection to others. And funding for this work was provided by the University of Manitoba Institute for the Humanities, and it was shown at Mawa. Later, the piece traveled to Toronto for Harbor Front Centers, the other was more just a uh, festival. This is my absolute favorite. This is a piece from Collections Agency, an exhibit here at C2, which was organized by the Manitoba Craft Museum and Library last year, curated by Alison Yearwood and Jenny Westerner, where artists were invited to respond to items in the museum's collection. Nyla Jensen responded to a so-called Manitoba tartan by creating these pillows and matching quilts inspired by the Northern Lights. 
not seeing herself represented by a tartan pattern that only speaks to the colonizer or silver or someone. Not it this Manitoba tartan didn't represent all the people who actually live in Manitoba. So Jensen, who was born in Jamaica, positioned herself in the narrative of Manitoba's history as an equal member. I'll give you lots of shout outs because collections, this is also from Collections Agency. This was the work by Jesse Januska, Winnipeg based interdisciplinary visual artist from the Kanpawaka Dakota First Nation. This fringed bag with, is beaded with the image of a woman's face and the words land back. The woman represented in the beadwork is Indigenous rights advocate Autumn Pelche. I also participated in the Collections Agency exhibition. In response to a small white knitted lace doily, I created this four feet in diameter knit piece entitled it Sangre, or Blood. With this piece, I speak of taking up space and naming the cost of colonization. I think the complexity of lace making, I link the complexity of lace making to the delicate work of unpacking the legacy of colonization. The stark, crisp white, whiteness of the doilies in general is a motif for me that harkens back to the early 1900s ideas of domesticity. They represent cultivating a controlled environment. So I responded with a large gesture of establishing my existence. I raised issue with the anonymity of the doily creator and I loudly take up space. I have this here because in doing my research, there's this part that kind of res resonated or is funny, depending on how I feel. Um, this, this was a quote from, from critics of activism. Are we to knit our banana covers to show our contempt for the ruling power? Asked one reader in The Guardian on rebel knitting. Forgive me, but what's next? Rebellious doilies? <laughs> yes, yes, rebellious doilies. I would love to include some discussion of why so much of the work of BIPOC folks has been ex excluded from the art world and from discussions on, on craftivism. While so many cultures have been using quilting, embroidery, arrieras, beading, weaving to tell our most urgent and poignant stories, much further back than the pointing of the term craftivism. The sudden use of craft in the art scene in the late 90s and early 2000s is seen as the beginning of craftivism, but that's not that it's not the case. Indigenous women have been gathering at kitchen tables to be. They have been passing on quill work, tufting, and other technologies for centuries. One more yes. Destroy the Myth is a hand embroidered on canvas by Nuneka Jones. She's a Trinidadian artist living in, in Tampa, Florida. Yeah. She was featured on the cover of Time magazine in August of 2020. Her bio says that she uses her artwork as a tool to advocate for the protection of women and girls of color. Though she is most well known for her realistic embroidered portraits with lasting impressions, she continues to be open and experimental in her practice. No. That's unbelievable. Just no. I want to speak about so many indigenous women warriors. That is a term used by Dr. Suzanne McLeod. She speaks of the role of beading as an act of resistance and knowledge transfer. Artists such as Ruth Cockhan, Christy Belfort, Lita Fontaine, Mead Dooley, there are so many examples of women, trans, and non-binary folks beyond the prairies that can be included by a, a, a kind of limited bias. Sherry Farrell-Reset and all the folks in the radical stitch, 
the groundbreaking exhibition at the Mackenzie Art Gallery, which, will, which is now at the National Gallery. Amy Malbuff says, beadwork is resistance, beadwork is revolutionary. We are celebrating and being proud of our culture. Being involved in these things makes us strong as individuals and nations. So I, I can show so many other artists, but we would be here all night. I think the process of activism is alive at Mawa. Where I work, we gather every week at our table and sometimes online. And we share stories and learn from fellow crafty folks. We strive to include people who will impart technical skills as well as share about their own cultural connections and causes that fuel their creativity. Mentoring Artists for Women's Art is an arts education organization dedicated to empowering women, trans, non-binary, and two-spirit visual artists. This last weekend, we hosted our second fieldwork workshop where we explored this challenging practice in an effort to help rematriate this practice. That is how Dr. Marie Matthews refers to the reclaiming of this tradition. Our aim is not just learning this skill, but we are working to keep this unique cultural tradition alive. On Saturday, we worked with Stanley the Porcupine. <laughs> Rest in peace, Stanley. <laughs> Thank you, Stanley. <laughs> Led by artist Mona Mokwin, we harvested and cleaned the hair, the guard hairs, the quills from the animal. Forming a small community that shares an interest in quill work is important, as this is not a practice that can be engaged in solitude. After the quills were washed and dyed in various colors, on the second day, we finally sat down to learn how to work with the quills themselves. And again, this is the process of practicalism, finding our strength and our voice together. Also pictured here is Gauntlet and Moccasin instructor Carol Frechette. And she says this is reconciliation work, people sitting shoulder to shoulder learning the craft. I can't speak on crafty activism without spending some time talking about the culture I grew up with that fuels my creativity to this day. In Guatemala, many women still wear traditional huipiles and portas proudly. They work in colectivos and learn from their grandmothers to keep their traditions alive. But their work is subject to many instances of designers appropriating their work without giving credit or financial remuneration. Since 2016, there has been a movement to change Guatemala's laws to defend indigenous weavers' intellectual property rights. While the tourism industry highlights Mayan weaving as a national treasure, indigenous people wearing the textiles continue to face racism and marginalization. The proposed law is not just for economic reasons, but it's about defending our identity, says Angelina Asquak. She's the leader of the Women's Association for the Development of Zacatecas. Although the law has not passed in it, it's lost in the Guatemalan government mayhem that has ensued recently. It has generated more awareness that Guatemalan weaving is a living art form that cannot be separated from issues of indigenous sovereignty and resistance. In Chile and other parts of Latin America, women gathered underground and stitched on the burlap sacks. They fill these reclaimed campuses with messages of resistance to the Pinochet regime. Our Pieras captured narratives of the atrocities the women were witnessing. They documented their bleak reality urgently, and they communicated messages via this tapestry-like storyboards. This exhibition took place in the spring this year at Sur Gallery in Toronto. The English translation of the exhibition pilot title is Conductive Threads, and the images of an arpiera by an unknown artist. A lot of arpieras were made by colectivos, so we don't know exactly who made individual pieces. My favorites! <laughs> A 
appearance is still being made today by contemporary living artists. Beatriz Barahona. Pictured here is Oda al Rio Mapocho, Ode to the Mapocho River. This piece collapses the scenes of violence and repression the Barahona witnessed in 1973 and the quotidian activities that take place on the riverbed in 2001 when Barona finally returned to Chile. In the same Riviera, the, lover, the lovers beneath a tree seem unaware of the bodies being dropped into the river from a helicopter. I believe that Barona as, is someone who embodies the process of craftivism. She is down to earth, fiercely engaged in helping immigrants and helping run events at the Chileno Association. She is always down to go to a protest or public gathering that involves sticking it to the man, right? <laughs> <laughs> this past spring, she co-hosted a preparathon at Mawa, where we celebrated International Women's Day. She helped people mend their beloved, beloved articles of clothing. She insists on fixing jackets and pants herself and proudly shows off how she improves upon her finds from local thrift stores. This past September, she unveiled an arpillera made collectively with other Chilenas in Winnipeg. It was revealed at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights at the event marking the 50th anniversary of Salvador Allende's death. Last year, she stitched an arpillera that speaks to, to her health and the effects of the aging process on her mind. Craftivism, the process, helps us obtain agency when we might feel helpless. It allows us to position ourselves openly on issues. And of course, we can't go and fight the bad guys ourselves, but we can wear a handmade pin or a shawl and everyone can see and join the cause. We do it because we believe that as Siobhan McCork writes, that creative expression has the power to shape how people think and act in the world. Machine zone. 
-hmm. So if she had like a workshop with lots of, because you don't you don't just go and buy nine sewing machines like you bought them <laughs> from your aunts and you and you collect the little pieces from the book for Depends on the person. You just borrow the machines from everyone you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but but I think this one was really clever. They kind of created it like a puzzle, and people did work at home, but then bring it together and stitch it all together. So that I think is, is really is one way of doing it, and it's been really successful for them. The other way that we can do it is, um, I mean, for this piece, for this piece, she made one person made the bulk of the work, and then the little small, the small squares um, were sent in, were added by participants. So, okay, I'm going to be honest. Craftivism is a big burden on, on the organizer, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like people will participate and create pieces, but I think out of uh, mm, I would say there's a there's a big burden on the, the actual people organizing to actually get it done. So I think this was a really clever and also after the it was made after the pandemic. It was just made in this past year, and it, it was a clever way of doing it. She created the the, the large wording, which um, she she used a material to kind of emulate hair because hair is what is covered by the hijab. So I think there's ways of doing it, but it's also really patient, and also you have to text people and force them to come. I have like thoughts that might turn into a question, but like I we're at the craft council, so that's this is like an interesting venue for this conversation because this is kind of what we do here. And throughout your talk, you've been you talked a lot about BIPOC people uh, and how craftivism is often used by them because the like craft their work is not seen as visual art, right? which is like, yes, we talk about this a lot here. I'm like kind of interested in your thoughts of like, do we think the fine arts are excluding these things because they're typically used by BIPOC people or like working class people? Or like, do you think there's other reasons? And like, do you have any thoughts on like, uh, we've been observing the like craft, like, like visual arts sort of like appropriating is the wrong word, but using craft, but maybe not well. <laughs> or like someone learns a craft a month before they make a piece and just know enough to do that piece. And then they're sort of being heralded as this excellent craftsperson. Anyway, I guess what I'm getting at is like thoughts, feelings, opinions, or like, you know, yeah. not, quite a, not quite a question, but like a share your thoughts sort of uh, <laughs> query. <laughs> Because we have like, we have like lots of mixed feelings about this in yes. lots of different ways. I, I want to go somewhere particular. Yes, please. Right there. <laughs> also, I've seen, like I drooled over this word for two months straight. And mm -hmm. also your coil around the edge is like the most genius thing I've ever seen to stretch a like crochet piece out of that size. It's like a very like medium specific problem that you solved very cleverly. So I just as an aside. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I went to it is because like I've been knitting all my life. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a person who like enjoys decoding a lace pattern. Mm -hmm. My lace patterns are like giant posters of little tiny things. Oh, I've so seen you in the patterns in the back here for like a whole day. <laughs> sometimes I enjoy it, sometimes I don't enjoy the going backwards. Um, 
So my experience in the activism milieu has been very specific because I did come to it with all that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the piece I installed in 2013, which was kind of like the first thing that brought me into, you know, because Pride Toronto is so well attended, it got a lot of eyes. And the response I had was from artists and non-artists alike. Um, but I have, I know what you mean, I don't want to name names, but there are artists who use, you know, blankets that they found at the thrift store, <laughs> or like, yeah. um, you do what you have to do. Totally. You do what you have to do. But I'm, I'm a hardcore purist, like I'm like, if I'm going to show you something handmade, I'm going to make sure it was handmade, and I'm going to make sure that it, I'm going to put my name on it, that it's going to have been you know, have had my own blood and sweat and tears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my response. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, as a teacher, I struggle with the word craft. Um, yeah. Because people are making a dream, and my vision of craft was like, you just buy pieces of thing. This is how you do it, <laughs> and go to town, like assembly line, like craft is assembly line, art is something you create from your mind. Mm -hmm. So now this is like, um, like we do, you know, when I'm, I'm in high school now, but like when I was in yeah, we do crafts with them, like it keeps them busy, we do crafts. But it's not like, like I feel like there's almost a third word that needs to be. Yeah, we talk yeah. about this a lot here too. Or like, like, and you yeah. know, like, that's, I don't know why you would call it, like, capital C craft. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. for sure. All, all caps, crafts. But like if I... As, as, a, as a teacher, when people ask me what my partner does, I'm not going to say craft. <laughs> because everyone's going to be like, no. But if you said she crafts person. Yeah, I do. Like an artist or a craft artist is often what I do, or fiber artist are the words that I use. But if I just said she does crafts, people are like, oh. He took a picture of like lumpy paper mache yeah. or pom yeah. poms. Yeah. yeah, I think this is like, I would love to hear your thoughts on this too, but just as like a few of my thoughts on this is that I think that this might actually come from this like hierarchy <laughs> and the like poo pooing of craft for lack of a better term, <laughs> which does have a lot to do with like working class people and like BIPOC people and the art they make, right? Sure, so yeah. it's poo pooed. Mm -hmm. Because of that, so you share your thoughts on this, but okay. like, I have two thoughts, but one of them is to stay. So we were talking about art making or craft making as it's either someone gives me the instructions and I just kind of assemble everything and I'm able to create to recreate the thing you made, or someone gives me a lot of material and I do what I want with it. Right, remember we were talking about this? Who was it that you were saying was a person that that was like James uh, Mom? Yeah, maybe. We were talking about craft as like everyone can learn how to how to sew, right? Like most people would, will be able to learn how to sew, but how do you go to 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 this? <laughs> <laughs> Well, right. I, I think it's fair to say that most human beings, even with the best materials, the best teacher, would not be able to pull this off. This is like Olympic athlete level craft. Yeah. You're right. Like, you have an elite, you have something about you that is yeah. elitely. Right, like, yeah. like yeah. most people could dedicate years to trying to pull this off and not get there. This is a life's work. If you have Michael Phelps of like, swimming and you have, <laughs> you can teach anybody to swim, but you can't. Yes, say, but we're not a. Uh, Neck Jones. I would say so. No, we're not Yeah. Well, it's a passion. It's gifted. It's time. It's work. It's you have to want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna say that when Maggie was talking about crafts at school, Spanish has two words for it. One is manualidades, which is the craft that you were talking about, and artesanías, which is the the art of making, of craft making. So this is like a language limitation, we're yes. like so. language I informing. I consulted with the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, my suggestion would be. We need to learn if that exists in other languages as well. We need to find a new word for the thing kids do with you. Yeah. Not like this crap. Besides garbage, What? <laughs> Your mom made the garbage. Oh, I love it. Learning. Hang on to it forever. I mean, I think. But like. Fridge This is called so fridge Although I think. I think this is craft. Yeah. And has like a history of like fine craftsmanship or first craftsmanship. Yeah. Although the history of craft is that the crafts you would give kids would lead them to be being craft like samples. They, they were, for example, you give your little girl a little embroidery thing, yeah. and then she makes a really beautiful embroidery, and then it decides and who she marries. <laughs> <which is all fine. laughs> but, but, you know, we would refer to like I I teach um, uh, in fashion, uh, and we are doing embroidery and. The pieces that there's, these are samplers. I explain, this is a sampler. This is not, this is not your artist. <laughs> You're not an artist yet. This is your sampler. You turn in your sampler, and I will mark it. And if it's good, maybe you should continue working with it. And if it's not, maybe you should do something. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, yeah, so like I, I use that word very specifically. But there is, in the art world, there's this huge divide, right? There's yes. craft and then there's a capital C art. And that's why I thought it was interesting to mm -hmm. me to come at the problem backwards, mm -hmm. to go and see Joyce Leland's work and be like, all right, I can see, I can see the craftsmanship in it. I can see the political messaging in it. I'll, I'll let her have <laughs> the craftsmanship label. <laughs> Going, going to it in a backwards kind of way because I think we have to really like position ourselves and that's why I started by saying yes I'm an activist like I really love the the language of, of owning the thing that you that you do like so can I just say what I think you're saying to make sure I'm getting your point you're making is the point you're kind of making like well craft if craft is good enough it doesn't become art. Like craft is a thing, its own culture mm -hmm. within its field yeah. within itself, and the the issue isn't that craft needs to be understood as art to receive its value, but that we should value craft for what it is. In for itself. craft. Yeah, mm -hmm. I completely agree. Yeah, that. that's a very like refreshing sentiment. I think. And I think Barb Hunt um, was talking about. Many times in history, people have tried, people tried to bring crafts into the visual arts, and many failed. Like the Bauhaus movement had like this whole institute of craft, and they just produced absolute garbage. And you know, like there's there's been a lot of different attempts at at saying, okay, this is craft, but oh my God, it's also art. Mm -hmm. um, and indigenous women in Canada have done this. They have elevated work that is that is craft, that is their own um, tradition, but it's it's art, like it's political, it's it's conceptual, it's yeah, but they're not playing by the art rules. They're but they're not playing by the art rules. They are just they they've created their own mm -hmm. their own environment in which they're they're staking a claim in the art world. And are doing really well with it. I think, and I think that's amazing because I think a lot of the work that we that that I learned as a kid, maybe it was to keep me busy, you know, maybe it was like to make sure I wasn't running around and I just kind of liked sitting at home doing my crafts. But it was instructing my mind in the visual arts somehow, mm -hmm. and this, that's just what I did the rest of my life. <laughs> Can I ask another question? Yeah. There was, so Guatemala has this big political riot right now. It's bad. And there was a group of um, Mayan women who set up an installation in front of the public ministry and the building. And it had like those big textile making, I don't know what they're called, the, the, the looms. And then, but it was like, I don't know, like the length, length of this room, like full of looms. Mm -hmm. And that's what they used to make their repiles and their skirts. And 
they were just weaving. That's, that was their practice. They were weaving and they, it had, um, had a sign that was just typewrite, uh, typewriting in white on paper that said weaving stories or weaving, no, sorry, weaving history is the right translation for it. And it, it was placed at the very top, like weaved in the loom. Is that craftivism? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. I'll, I'll, it's a TikTok video, so okay. I'll share it with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Send it to the craft council. We yeah. have the technology. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is amazing art activism happening on the streets of Guatemala right now because, mm -hmm. once again, we have an election and we don't like who was elected or some people don't, whatever. It's exhausting. Um, it's also terrifying, but the amount of song and theater and it, like the protests are just look like a fun party. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but also there is crack because because the rights of indigenous people are at the crux of the problem that they're facing right now. Like the indigenous vote has to count, and they're just trying to. They're trying to erase part of the vote because because people came out in droves to vote for the new government and and so like that's that's what I'm saying like you can't you can't take the craft out of the the cultural value like you, it, and you can't say oh this was craft and that's it it's a living thing it's a it's a living art. That's why I talk about Tia so much because she's making them as she continues to exist and she continues to express those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we here think about craft as being really connected to culture, mm -hmm. just in that, like, that is how craft traditions exist. And, like, most people who do textiles learn to know from their grandmother, or their auntie, or their mother. There's a sort of like, passing down and it, like you touch craft and it's really intimate and you possibly use it, you know, like, uh, and I think that that feels really right in a lot of ways, like what you're saying, that like, the people get to decide what craft is. And, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Adrian. This is like a really interesting conversation Q&A and I really love me too. I, I was really nervous, but this feels really like I'm in my living room. <laughs> we talk about these things all the time.